Greetings, everyone. This must be episode 16 of Canadian Meets the South. Um, today, I'll be reviewing John C. Calhoun, Heretic, American Heretic, by Robert Elder. Now, last year, this book came out, and I heard about it from Dr. Brian McClanahan. Uh, who, um, whose podcast I've watched a lot, the Brian McClanahan show. And he talked a little bit about this book. So my first thoughts going into the book were that it was written by a neoconservative, uh, this Robert Elder person who would talk a lot about slavery, about how John C. Calhoun did everything for slavery. Although, um, he does go into a lot of details about Calhoun's life. Really talks about how his father and his father's parents came from Ireland. And I think his grandmother was from Ireland, but of Scottish descent. Now, and, and talks a little bit about how Calhoun's father had voted for having a constitutional the uh, constitutional convention in in South Carolina as a state legislature later um I got the impression from listening to Margaret L Mead's book John C. Calhoun, American Portrait, which I previously reviewed on this channel, that John C. Calhoun's father, Patrick Calhoun, was an anti-federalist who believed that the Constitution was taxation without representation now, you, he actually wasn't in the convention because supposedly he voted for the, con the convention. And so, and I, I was a little confused, but Patrick Calhoun was, I believe, a soldier in the American War for Independence. And he was certainly a slaveholder. Uh, Patrick Calhoun's father didn't own any slaves when he came to America, but Patrick Calhoun did. And uh, so that's why slavery has was a, an important part of John C. Calhoun's life. And how there was one slave, I don't remember his name, who, who was with John C. Calhoun from a very young age, as in both of them were really young. And that slave was the son of Patrick Calhoun's slave. So slavery was a deep part of his culture and his way of life. Although Calhoun was not from the Charleston elite, like his wife, Flory Calhoun. But um, before he you know, married Flory, he was a student in Yale in Connecticut. And back when the president of the college 
was Timothy Dwight. And this was back when Connecticut still had slavery. John, uh, Thomas Jefferson always mourned about the fact of that the northern schools were what he called Federalist Mills. And that's why he founded the University of Virginia. Although now <laughs> Jefferson's getting canceled. Just like Robert E. Lee. Um, I'll talk a little bit about Robert E. Lee later. A tiny bit. But Calhoun was the one... No, well, Calhoun in at Yale n never became a Federalist. And Timothy Dwight wasn't happy about that. But he was probably one of the most important people to come out of Yale. And he... And today... He is being cancelled at Yale. They wanted to remove his name from Yale or something. Like, um, Yale, what? I don't even remember. There's something about Clemson College. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just rambling here. What else can I say? Cal um, but he became states rights guy in Yale supposedly at least according to Margaret Mead um, and certainly the idea of states rights in the north was in existence during Calhoun's time at Yale the federalists had just had been defeated right oh uh, he Calhoun was at Yale when Thomas Jefferson was president of the United States. So Federalists wanting to check the power of the Republicans in government was um, they advocated for states' rights. The the nor the Northern Federalists were sectionalists, right? Um Ad they advocated for nationalism when they were in power and when it suited their interests. But states' rights when they were not in power and and those in power would advocate against their interests. So, um, after going to Yale, he, he spent one term in the state legislature and Calhoun, uh, Calhoun I think was helped or was supportive or, or helped create the Compromise of 1808 which balanced the powers between the low country and the high the up country one of, I don't remember which one is which but one of them was majority black and the other was majority white as in one, meaning one had a lot more slaves than the other. And Calhoun believed, he, he talked about this supposedly in the discourse on the Constitution of the United States, the, the, the Compromise of 1808 in South Carolina. And this balance of power, he believed, led to the equality of the white man, supposedly. <clears throat> I think Vermont was was the first state in general to, to introduce universal white male suffrage. But the southern states were quick to follow, or at least South Carolina, because they wanted to ensure that all that the white man was above the black man. And so the you can say the white rich aristocrats were okay with bringing up the the poor white farmers 
who didn't have any property. At least that was what Robert Elder is trying to tell us. And it's not like I disbelieve him. <clears throat> and he later talks about um, when he becomes Secretary of War, Calhoun talks to Secretary of State John Quincy Adams that it, equality was important. It, that slavery was important because it ensured equality among white men. And I'm not going to say that Calhoun was at the bottom of society. He, he certainly wasn't at the top of South Carolinian society, but he wasn't at the bottom either. He was well off enough to, to even have slaves. So it's hard. It's hard to see the average poor white man believing that slavery would help him uh, would help him like as in if he's he's above let's say free blacks maybe i i don't know it, it's calhoun would also talk about slavery in, in the context of the the 1840s the, um he brought up this study which john quincy adams criticized for being faulty um of how free blacks in the north were poor and uneducated and it was buying into to calhoun's views that slavery was a positive good as it existed in the south and i know one senator from ohio he had he had said he, he had accused calhoun of saying that uh it was slavery in the abstract that Calhoun defended, but Calhoun ang angrily denied that it was slave that it was slavery in the abstract. The senator from Ohio claimed that Calhoun believed slavery was so good that poor whites should be enslaved. But that's not. But that wasn't what Calhoun believed. What I learned from Robert Elder's book was that the positive good speech in 1837 was in response to William Howard C Cable. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that. A senator from Virginia. He was a former Jacksonian Democrat who became a Whig over his opposition to the independent treasury. And the senator from Virginia had said that he does not defend slavery in the abstract, like John C. Calhoun, and that he was in the line of Washington, Jefferson, and Marshall, that slavery was a unnecessary evil. So Calhoun goes on the offensive from that and says it is not an evil, it is a positive good. And this is this is in response to his fellow southern slave owner, who actually I did a little bit of research on William Howard Cable. He was against secession. Oh, he died in 1868, so after the war. But when Virginia seceded, he sided with his state. And many, many of these Southern Whigs did, even though... <clears throat> well, I mean, some of the Southern Whigs were, were certainly more states' rights-oriented than others. Uh, 
I guess an example would be John Tyler, even though he got kicked out of the presidency pretty early on in his, not in his, I'm pretty, got kicked out of the Whig party pretty early on in his uh, presidency. I found John Bell is also an interesting character. Um, this isn't anything related to Calhoun. I don't think John Bell was in, was mentioned in this book. Uh, at least I don't remember. But John Bell was originally a, Dem a Democrat like uh, John Tyler. And he became a, he was in Andrew Jackson's state of Tennessee. And he later became a leading Whig. And then when one of the, the, the Whig leaders of Tennessee died, he became the, the leader of the Whigs in Tennessee. And Andrew Jackson called him an apostate for that. But in, but he was in William Harris, Henry Harrison's cabinet as the secretary of war and was like most of the cabinet, except for Daniel Webster. He resigned after John Tyler uh, vetoed the charter of the central bank twice. So, what does that mean? Um, oh, well, what happened after with John Bell? And as you know, John Bell's famous for being on the ticket, the presidential ticket for the Constitutional Union Party, trying to not talk about slavery at all, trying to be the non-sectionalist candidate. He was a slave owner, though. And he won three states. Um... And Brian McClanahan had said that if he had campaigned on extending the Missouri Compromise to the South, if anyone, which I guess includes John Bell, had, had campaigned about extending Missouri, the Missouri Compromise to the South, which would be later known as the Crittenden, Crittenden Compromise, which was, which, would, which was after... Abraham Lincoln's election, but before he took office, if he had done that, he would have, he would have won in the landslide of any one of them. But after the, after Tennessee had seceded, he sided with his state. So it's, it was with many, many Whigs, I'm going to assume, had sided with their state. But I'm sure Calhoun would have been relieved to know that even though the Whigs were, some of the Whigs were undermining state sovereignty in other areas such as internal improvements, the tariff, the central bank. But John Tyler and John Bell uh, ended up on the same side of the of the American war for no, the Southern War for Independence, um, even though Bell had resigned from Tyler's cabinet, but uh, back to Calhoun. Um, it's a, it was a long book. It was twenty to twenty one hours. Um. We can talk about, uh, let's go into phrase phases. I'll talk a little bit about each of his phases. So he was a freshman congressman. He did not understand what it meant to be in opposition, like John Randolph of Roanoke did when they had met in the House of, of Representatives. And John Randolph of Roanoke had said that the Warhawks, including Clay and Calhoun, were against. Uh, no, we're we're going against the principles of ninety eight, um, you know, from the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions. And certainly, their 
they weren't very strong on states' rights at the time. Um, Cal, uh, Randolph was his first really big rival in the House of Representatives. Um, but Calhoun would later, you know, get get the take the mantle of states' rights from. Uh, from John Randolph after he resigns from the from the pre vice presidency in order to become a Uni United States senator. Um, damn, I can talk more about this. I remember reading one time a letter um, about um, John Randolph of Roanoke. This is 1832, 1833. He said that I do support President Jackson, but um, I wouldn't want either Martin Van Buren or John C. Calhoun to be the president. And he said Van Buren is better than Calhoun, but he still lacks what it takes to be a leader that General Jackson had. Um, but this was, this, this is Cal, this is Randolph. Randolph's obviously one of my favorite, um, people in history. And I could talk more about him, but, um, he was, I would say, um, really important because, sorry, Russell Kirk had, in, in his chapter on Southern conservatism in the conservative mind, he puts two men in it, uh, John Randolph of Roanoke and John C. Calhoun. Uh, I've listened to that chapter a few times and I, I recommend listening to that one. It was really good. They both, they're both advocates of states' rights and and feared the and were as Randolph would say jealous of federal government power when it came to the states but Randolph did not believe that Calhoun was principled he was an opportunist <clears throat> let's go to his time as secretary of war Calhoun was initially in the House of Representatives, right? And he actually survived um, uh, his last election in 1816 because many of the, the congressmen in 1816 had committed political suicide by voting for a pay raise. But Calhoun stood by and he survived. And, but then several months after um, James Monroe takes office. Calhoun was um was chosen as uh Secretary of War for two, which I guess would replace C Crawford, who was it, who was who would go on, who, who would be the Secretary of the Treasury under Monroe. He would move to the Treasury Department. And um, you would see some of his, you would see from the Monroe Doctrine, there's a Monroe Doctrine from this administration, which Calhoun would champion. Um, although the Monroe Doctrine was, was, even though like John Quincy Adams was known for the Monroe Doctrine, and this is something that they agreed on, one aspect of foreign policy that they would agree on. But later on, you would see something else. Um, they certainly, ha uh, Calhoun certainly had an expansionist view of the United States, which is why he wanted to take land from Canada in the War of 1812, but it didn't happen. And 
uh, the slavery question started in 1820, like with the Missouri Compromise. However, Calhoun was in cabinet, but he, like the rest of the cabinet members, all supported the Constitution. I mean, all supported the Compromise of 1820. But there was a disagreement on the reason with John Quincy Adams. John Quincy Adams had a moral opposition to slavery and told that to Calhoun. And Calhoun, and this was, they were friends, but this was something that they could not see eye to eye on. Moving, moving on, Calhoun would become vice president. And he went in his first term as vice president, it was still believed by some people like the Adams supporters, you could say, who voted for him as vice president, that he was in favor of a strong tariff, which actually Andrew Jackson kind of was too. But during the 1824 election, Calhoun was adamant that Crawford would not become president. And this is something I'm not sure if he really regretted. Because there was a difference uh, of personalities between them. And Crawford, among all of them, all of the candidates was the strongest on states' rights, and Calhoun wasn't he wasn't at that position yet, certainly. And he believed Crawford was a radical. But things would change in when he become when um during his time as vice president. Calhoun and would would be in the this debate with with John Quincy Adams. He had he had become you can say the the figurehead of the opposition after after the supposed corrupt bargain between Adams and Clay. And Calhoun was in the Patrick Henry versus John Oslo debates. He was he wrote as John Oslo, famous sp English Speaker of the House, while uh, John Quincy Adams would would be would would write as uh, Patrick Henry. Now, um, and certainly, um, it talks about him changing his views on the tariff when a tie was set up for him in 1827 against the wool tariff he vetoed it see in 1816 he supported the tariff and new england was against the tariff but it was pennsylvania and new york that sided with some of the southerners to to pass through the tariff of 1816 which Daniel Webster was against, and so was, uh, so was John Randolph, and John Randolph hated the hate, hated Webster, even though, um, because you know he was a tertium quid, um, as in he he never joined the Federalists, like Thomas Jefferson predicted. He was he was being the principal Republican. And eighteen and another thing that he did as vice president, besides having many other vetoes, was his um was his view on how the vice presidency should operate because he believed that the vice president does not have the power to call to order only actual uh, senators who 
who stood out of line in the Senate, while as this later Vice President Millard Fillmore would call to order Thomas Hart Benton <laughs> during the debates on the Compromise of 1850, around the time that Calhoun would die. But he refused to call to order John Randolph of Roanoke back in 1826, 1828, um, and said that only he believed only those elected to the Senate as senators would had the power to call each other out, out on order, even though the vice president was the presiding officer. And later, he would be, uh, later he would become vice president under Andrew Jackson, which um, Martin Van Buren had rallied up the Crawfordites to, to be next to Andrew Jackson. You, know, you could say they coalesced the Jacksonians and the Crawfordites under Jackson and Martin Van Buren. And the Crawfordites had to just accept that Calhoun would be the vice president for the time being. But Crawford was delighted to, when he was still alive, to send to uh, to put a wedge between Calhoun and Jackson over Calhoun's uh, desire to um, do an investigation on Andrew Jackson while Jackson was conquering Florida after J J Jackson decided to take Spanish Florida. And it, it's a really complicated situation but this split the two of them Andrew Jackson didn't realize that didn't learn that John C Calhoun wanted to take well wanted to get get him under investigation and the letter that Crawford sent to Jackson kind of implied if not outright said, said that Calhoun wanted to arrest him and Calhoun never called for the arrest, but if there's an investigation, if something's found, then there's going to be an arrest. Um, so it was technically true that Calhoun never called for Andrew Jackson's arrest, but the damage was done. And then also it goes into the Petticoat Affair, which I don't know if I've talked about this before, but uh, there's a lot. John C. Calhoun that I don't want to talk about right now. And of course, um, the nullification crisis, which was, you know, the relationship was broken by then. Um, one final thing before the nullification crisis. He, um, as vice president, he, he vetoed, I say vetoed, you know what I mean. Um, Martin Van Buren's appointment as Minister to Great Britain, which ironically elevated him to become Jackson's new vice president, as in, um, to replace Calhoun. Calhoun resigns after the 1832 election, but during the nullification crisis, in order to take a seat in South as South Carolina's one of South Carolina's senators and this was after sorry uh, this is um this was taking Robert Haynes seat um during the Jefferson dinner uh Robert Hayne was hoping that Jackson would support nullification because after all Jackson had helped had had supported Georgia in ignoring uh, John Marshall's um, uh, court case that supported the the Indians in Georgia. He said, um, he said, he was famous for saying, John Marshall has made his decision, now let him enforce it. 
or maybe it's an, an apocryphal quote because supposedly that quote, quote only came after um it was by um uh Horace Greeley supposedly who wrote that in the New York Tribune but who knows if that true quote was true or not but anyways Calhoun um in, in Robert Hayden what want was hoping that Jackson would support nullification but Jackson didn't and he in at the toast he's he had said um on uh, we uh the un the union we must we must preserve it or something I already forget um and Calhoun's next toast as vice president would say uh, next to our liberty most dear oh yeah he said the union it must be preserved and Calhoun said that this um yeah calhoun's response was next to our liberty most dear and <laughs> you know margaret l Mead's imagery of the situation when she in her in her calhoun book was that the lines of appomattox had been drawn there because even though both of them were southern slave owners who were born in the same state south carolina uh Calhoun was was the one who who favored state sovereignty while Jackson believed the union was stronger was more important but anyways after the nullification crisis and oh I guess one thing to know about Robert Elder is that he brings up about how many in South Carolina, the hardcore radicals uh, who were more, who were closer in line with Robert Barnwell Rett, the ones who straight up wanted, were okay with both, uh, who were okay with secession and maybe didn't believe nullification went far enough. There were some secessionists who didn't believe in nullification during that time, during the nullification crisis in South Carolina. But um, m many of them didn't like Calhoun. They didn't believe he was strong enough on states' rights. And some of the nullifiers believed that he had co-opted their, their um, movement because, and, and made and, and watered down nullification because Calhoun said that after nullification, um, there should be a constitutional amendment or three quarters of the states would have to decide whether it was wrong, whether the law was constitutional or not. And then afterwards, then that, that state that nullified the law would, would, uh, be, uh, would have to choose to stay in the union or leave and these conditions, Calhoun, Calhoun's ideals, those, those, those were not taken kindly to some of the nullifiers. They, they didn't believe that he was strong enough on states' rights. But um, fast forward to um, Harrison, Harrison defeating Van Buren, uh, vice, uh, uh, current President Van Buren. In 1840 and um, I mean by then Calhoun's views on the American system have changed and were more in line with John Randolph's views well just to some degree John Randolph had said that the American system was more Hamiltonian than Hamilton than Hamilton's system um, because it was basically it was basically the same thing. Well, it basically did, wanted the same thing. What Henry Clay wanted was the same thing. Um, but 
another thing that I noticed was that he was Calhoun still understood that internal improvements were what the West wanted. And if they want if the South wanted an alliance with the West to counter the northern se- sectionalism, then he would need Uh, then they would ha- the South would have to allow for internal improvements, even though they were, you know, unconstitutional. And um, let's see. I guess as a senator, he he develops in the Senate. His big rivalry is with not just Clay and Webster, but also with Thomas Hart Benton southern slave owner himself but certainly um uh, the most loyal jacksonian um in the senate along with later um sam houston first from uh, a senator from i think tennessee like jackson and then later of texas well, and Houston was a Jacksonian, but he also hated Calhoun because Calhoun did not like how Houston had gone to him in back in around 1818 when he was Secretary of War and Houston was a soldier, but he was he painted himself and dressed like an Indian and was with the Cherokee at the time talk, um, presenting himself too to John C. Calhoun as Secretary of War. And Calhoun did not did not approve of it, did, did not like this, but there you go. Um their relationship would be really bad. And Calhoun would leave the Senate to replace uh, uh to replace um uh oh man who was the Secretary of War? Ah. Um, uh, Abel Upshur, because, um, oh, or I think he was the Secretary of State. Yeah, he was first. He was the Secretary of War, but then under John Tyler. But then he moved. He he became Secretary of, of State when when Daniel Webster left. And John and then he died, on, on the I think USS Liberty. So his re- so he would be replaced by John C. Calhoun, who was uh, uh, unanimously voted in, vo- uh, confirmed in the Senate, because by then he had he was uh, he was a respected me- member. Now he was respected among the Senate by everyone, still, and he would. Uh, he would write a letter to the lower uh, to the British minister to the United States about how his foreign policy was aligned was about what well, he wanted Texas to expand slavery and this this destroyed Martin Van Buren's chances of getting the Democratic nomination because Southerners uh, because the the issue, the issue of Texas became a sectional te- issue of slavery, and he couldn't support it, or he would alienate members, uh, Democrats in the North, and so uh, Calhoun delighted that um, Van Buren, whom he chose to ally with during Van Buren's presidency, would be denied the denied the nomination over slavery over this slavery texas issue <clears throat> and another thing um vo- um after this you would have polk as president he would defeat clay who who also he didn't say that slavery or that te- that the acquiring Texas was necessarily a bad idea, but 
at the time he didn't want it because it would ignite sectional tissue, sectional issues and he needed and he needed his support from the north and so polk polk wins and also clay had said some pro yeah he had certainly said some pro slave pro texas annexation stuff to southerners and anti annexation stuff to northerners and when the two when newspapers from the two sections would compare, they would see, okay, this guy is trying to play both sides. He's trying to have it both ways. While as Polk was clearly in favor of Texas annexation. But um, after the annexation of Texas, you would, um, there was also the Oregon question, which John C. Calhoun had had worked on it and and, and still push for it back when he was Secretary of State, but then when he was back in the Senate, he I think he had asked Polk uh, um to veto the veto Oregon uh, the, the banning of the uh, the Congress banning slavery from Oregon and he was as um and he said. Um, and it, it passed the Senate, like, 26-24. The two Southerners who supported it were Sam Houston and, and uh, Benton, uh, Benton uh, Thomas Hart Benton. He, he had called them traitors to the South, even though neither of them were sectionalists. They were... They, Benton and... Houston were not the strongest on states' rights because they believed in a, American, a bit in Manifest Destiny, just like Andrew Jackson. They were, I would say, they were the closest to the tr the true disciples of Andrew Jackson. Maybe, um. Houston more <laughs> more than Benton because Benton sometimes when Andrew Jackson was in presidency he sometimes voted for against certain things but these two were the most uh, the 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 truest Jacksonians but they so but they were somehow a minority among the Southern Democrats because the South was in line with uh, the South. Southern Democrats have become the states, the states' rights Southerners, and then you would see here lies the problem. Um, that Calhoun saw the South was divided among Whigs and Southerners, and he had been chosen chosen to become. A Democrat to combat against Henry Clay's uh, constitutional mech machinations, machinations of and economics, central centralizing economics. But he wanted more Whigs to be on side with him. Cal Calhoun wanted more Whigs to be on side with him, and he was he wanted Southern unity, which wasn't exactly existing. With, with this rift between Southern Whigs and Southern Democrats, he wanted people to be less loyal to their party and and more to their section. Real sectional to him, sectional interests should matter more. And he was telling the Southern Democrats as well that the Northern Democrats are still going to vote to screw them over. But um. Uh. Even in part of it, like 1860, part of this is, you could say, especially among the border states, the, the, uh, the, the upper south, you would see that there is, there are big party battles being fought in, 
in the upper states like Tennessee and Kentucky, Whigs and Democrats fighting over power. Um, well, as South Carolina, while South Carolina was united, South Carolina united early under the Democrats after Pres William C. Preston, who was John C. Calhoun's um, fellow senator and was also a fellow nullifier, um, resigned over the passage of Martin Van Buren's independent treasury, which Calhoun supported. And so South Carolina was mostly united and in, in, in becoming a one party state. But if you looked at Kentucky, Tennessee, Virginia, uh, even Georgia had, was, you can say divided among, not, I guess not just, not just the, uh, the upper South, but certainly, um, Georgia, like you can think of Robert Toombs and Alexander H. Stevens who were the Whigs, but like later they would join the Democrats. And they, oh, and you can, not so much with Mississippi, you would have Henry Foote, who was a Democrat, but he had, you could say, Whig principles because he was a unionist and was against secession in 1860. And he wanted compromise we can talk about yeah um zachary taylor and the compromise of 1850 because um the southern whigs all lined up and behind taylor after he had defeated um scott and clay in the whig convention interestingly enough they were all born in virginia but scott didn't have any slaves and clay had said some things believing that's he believes you know slavery was kind of was somewhat wrong was a unnecessary evil kind of while while taylor did not say say anything about slavery at all during 1848 and then so the the wig the southern wig slave owners um who actually lined up under clay in the in his failed bid for the Whig nomination in 18 the 1839 convention um they were at, after so much of him saying these somewhat anti-slavery things and being part of the american colonization society the southern whigs including one of Henry Clay's close allies, I think it was Crittenden or or Francis Preston Blair, um, lined up. Well, that guy, um, Blair or Crittenden, lined up before Henry Clay decided to to run again in eighteen forty eight for the Whig nomination, but. Taylor, who the, the Southern slaveholding Whigs lined up so easily with Taylor, and then they were, then they found it hard to defend him against the Southern Whig, the Democrats when the Whigs, uh, when it turned out that Taylor was in favor of California entering as a, as a free state. Taylor didn't care about slavery or no slavery. He, he just he wanted California. And Taylor, th Taylor threatened, te uh, some Texans with hanging if when after they, had brought up secession. But um, uh, let's talk about John Cal John C. Calhoun's last speech. Because the Whigs were so divided, no, the, the Southerners were so divided during this compromise period 
of 1850, and even among the Democrats, um, you would have Benton, on the, a couple of days after Calhoun's funeral in the Senate, uh, you would have Foot pull out a gun on Benton. And, and the thing is, these, both of these guys were unionists. And they both supported California admission. But Foote, who favored the omnibus, and Benton, who did not, um, were um, so were uh, in really bad terms. And I think Foote was trying to warm up to Calhoun more, while as Ben, like he was, he was described by one se the senator from Arkansas. I'm not sure at the time at the Compromise of 1850 as a servile follower of John C. Cal Calhoun. Um, and after Calhoun makes his speech, makes his speech against the Compromise of 1850, read by Senator James Mason, because. Calhoun was deathly ill. He was about to die. Ford had said to Calhoun, why didn't you tell me about this? And Calhoun said, I don't tell anyone. As, and he was, why do I need to tell you? Essentially saying, why does Ford think that he's so special in Calhoun's eyes or something? I mean, both of them were, certainly both of them wanted to preserve the union. But during the Compromise of 1850, even among the Southern Democrats, these are, they are, I had various views. Jefferson Davis would, who actually favored a secret, uh, on the Department of the Interior, which Calhoun decried as unconstitutional, would, would say, no, would later take up the mantle of, Calhoun as the leader of most of the Southern Democrats, while as uh, even though Jefferson Davis didn't believe in nullification, and um, what else can I say? And you had Benton, who really despised Calhoun, even though. They were both Southern Democrats. Like Calhoun, like Benton, in in the eighteen forties especially, had said that he was against slavery. And his support for most of the Compromise of eighteen fifty, but and specifically not voting for the fugitive slave clause, and the, for the strengthening of. For the, for the fugitive slave law in the Compromise of 1850 uh, made him lose his seat to the Whigs. Although some pro-slavery Democrats supported the Whig candidate at the time. And let's see. And they, meanwhile, Foot was censored as a senator, All, and then because of his support for the Compromise of 1850, he was the only senator from Mississippi to support the Compromise of 1850, and uh, he would later become, but he would barely become, um, win, he would win against Jefferson Davis in the election for governor of Mississippi by barely beating Jefferson Davis before losing the election to some other Democrat. And then going to California, failing to become a Senator there as a know nothing candidate and then going to Tennessee and then arguing in against secession during Tennessee's convention, but then becoming a Confederate Congressman and and fight and fighting over Jefferson Davis, but 
Jefferson Davis had amassed, you can say, the support for the Southern Whigs, no, the Southern Democrats, even though he wasn't a nullifier. So even within the Southern Democrats, you would see there's there are a lot of different ideas, a lot of different personalities who believed in different things on how different ways on how to save the Union. Calhoun's speech against the Compromise of 1850 said, there is nothing that the, the South can do. Only the North can do it. And they need to stop trying to deprive the South of power. The state slavery issue was about power and the, because as well as the Constitution. One, because the Northern states were nullifying the Fugitive Slave Clause in the Constitution. And two, they were, they were against, uh, they were in favor of using the ten, uh, the, of using Congress, uh, congressional laws to ban slavery in the territories so that Southerners couldn't bring their property in. Now that's a whole different story with when Southerners making this about property and the Fifth Amendment and using substantial substantive due process with uh, chiefly like Roger Taney uh, supporting this. That's a whole different story. Um, and McClanahan said, uh, you know, Brian McClanahan said that this is problematic this because even before the 14th Amendment, you would have this case of substantive due process, which recently, as you know, um, in his concurring opinion, Justice Thomas, Clarence Thomas, said that he was against substantive due process. And I remember he, in his, in his Lincoln speech, at Washington and Lee University, I think, and uh, Justice Thomas talks about the about squatter sovereignty or popular sovereignty in in the Kansas Nebraska Act, followed by the uh, substantive due process in the Dred Scott decision, as if they were working together. And, but actually, the Dred Scott decision is rebuking the Kansas-Nebraska Act because it is quite literally the opposite of... It is going against popular sovereignty. But this is really a thorny issue of like, the issue of property. Because they, the Southerners were going too... I think they were going too hard on property in the Fifth Amendment. And they should have focused on the principle of the Tenth Amendment. See, this 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 whole obsession with property as a constitutionally protected right by Southerners wouldn't be in there if not for the Bill of Rights. Because yes, the Tenth Amendment is in the Bill of Rights, but the principle of the Tenth Amendment was already in the United States Constitution, as you can see, like if you, all the different speeches are taught, have the principle of the 10th Amendment in it. So there was no need for the Bill of Rights, 10th Amendment or not. Um, and I think that's, it opens up this Pandora's box. No, no Bill of Rights, no idea of substantive due process. Um, that's 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 how I see it. Um, but one last thing, Calhoun, Calhoun's uh, view on England. Although there are two views. One, England was trying to emancipate the world. And so that's why his foreign policy later as a senator and as secretary of state was focused on allying himself with Cuba and, and uh, Brazil. Even, and 
Brazil was a monarchy, even though, but it had slavery. And he talked about how Mexico and the and the Spanish uh, the Hispanic republics were made a mistake by like the Spanish made a mistake by interbreeding with the natives, and also he was against swallowing up me the well he was against the Mexican American War in the first place, but he was he was then saying okay I'm not saying we ca we can't take some prop some land from Mexico, but we cannot swallow Mexico as a whole. Or we will, we will have a religious civil war without end, and they will be. They will be. They will be lower than the rest of the United States because you know they're not. They're mixing with the natives has made them not white. And they made the mistake, of doing that. Um. Meanwhile, Sam Houston especially wanted to swallow Mexico whole, and Polk was tempted of doing that. Um, and they, they, they didn't eventually, because, you know, also another thing Calhoun said is that they were a fellow republic. <laughs> he couldn't say that about Brazil, because Brazil was a monarchy at the time. Um, and during his days as Secretary of War, and even as a congressman, not as, as a representative, he's he was in favor of all these revolutions in Latin America of turning into republics, and he and this was helped him help you know just the overall administration be in support of this, even though many of these Latin American republics, let's say Venezuela, for example. Uh, supported Haiti and then all the slave owners were worried that after the violent revolution in Haiti that it, that revolution could come to the United States uh, the, it was a it was a slave rebellion and most of the white people were, well, or maybe um were killed and it became a black republic and so there was some cons Robert Elder talks about this contradiction here but Later on, uh, uh, he would be more, uh, he, he would have, it wouldn't be just about republics, but slavery was also really important, which is why he liked Brazil. Oh, uh, and Brazil had slavery until the 1880s, too. There were some Confederates who moved to Brazil after the war. Um... Let's talk about the election. Oh my god. Um, several elections. I'm looking int intriguingly at Alberta's provincial election. Because right now, I guess the, the top four people would be Daniel Smith is the front runner and Travis Taze. Which is who is supposed to, the former minister of finance, supposedly Kenny's favorite guy, um, pick for his successor, and Brian Jean, who is, tr who is trying to get some oxygen as the anti Kenny pick, and he um he's, well. Uh, Brian Jean wants autonomy, well as Daniel Smith. Is put is straight up pushing for Alberta an Alberta Sovereignty Act. Travis Tate is saying we need to work within the legal means and blah blah blah. Um, I watched West the Western Standards de debate on the three of them, uh, with just the three of them, and Brian Jean saying yeah, he wants autonomy within, and obviously decentralizing healthcare, because he and both Tays and. Brian Jean believe in uh, uh, parental choice for schools, school choice, and I obviously I I'm interested in Todd Lowen. He was the guy who got kicked out of the UC, uh, the UCP caucus for taught, uh for speaking out against the lockdowns. Um and um. 
he and I guess Todd, uh, Todd, uh, Travis Taze are also speaking out against euthanasia. Um, certainly, there's some. There, it's a it's a very interesting race because supposedly Alberta, well, Albert, those everyone, well, maybe not everyone, in that race, like the. I would say those four people, at least, at the very least, are more conservative than Doug Ford. And certainly are more interested in checking Ottawa's power to varying degrees. It looks like Daniel Smith is the most interested in checking the power of Ottawa because she's straight up advocating for nullification. With her Alberta Sovereignty Act. And I commented on Twitter one time. I'm glad that you're following. That she's adopted the principles of 98. And then some guy was saying. We don't need American kooky politics. And I'm just saying. We have much to learn from our sister federation. Because. Their, their model of federalism. Before. Before the, the revolution of 1913, and especially before uh, Abraham Lincoln's election, it's much better. Uh, the Republic was still there. The Federal Republic was still there. Although Brian McClanahan said you could argue it, the Constitution was destroyed in 1789 with the passage of the Judiciary Act, which I'm um, not gonna get into here. I don't know much about that one. Um, but yeah, I'm. I I'm really interested in the Alberta conservative leadership race. We'll see who who wins. And there's another thing. I remember one Alberta UCP MLA who was from rural Alberta was accusing the ones from Calgary of on. Like the committee for COVID restrictions to to uh, that they were in favor of lockdowns, while the rural out Al- the rural MLAs were out were outnumbered by the Calgary MLAs. So he it was really so I well I was thinking wow this is kind of like Calhoun he was this is sectionalism. People are thinking more along sectional lines, not just party lines. Party, at the face of it, is what gives power, and especially in in Can- in the in Canadian legislatures, because the leader of the the party and with the most seats, or usually is becomes the premier or the prime minister in. Canadian parliaments, um, which is different, which is different from the United States, because in the United States, governors and presidents are have are separate, have separate powers. I mean, obviously, it depends on not from the legis from their respective from legislatures. Obviously, it depends on how the state constitution is written. Um, I'm sure some state constitutions allow for the governors to be more in line with, uh, to, to more more legislative than others. Um, in Alexander H. Stevens' cornerstone speech, he talks about how the Confederate Constitution is has been has gotten a little more closer to Britain's constitution as it relates to cabinet members being able to be picked from the legislature. And he believed that this was a strength. Certainly, but it can also be a weakness because he, because the debate can um the president would then or the executive would be able to to pressure the cabinet members to vote in a certain way you know if they want to stay in cabinet 
So there are pros and cons to this. I mean, but they still favored, like the Confederate Constitution still favored a limited executive. Supposedly. I mean, I don't want to say that. Like, and um, and then let's talk about the federal conservative leadership race. Well, people think Pierre Polyev's going to win. It's going to depend on if he wins on the first ballot or not. I remember Jean Charest saying to Andrew Lott in, in an interview, whether it was Bernier in 2017 or Peter McKay in 2020, if the if the front runner doesn't lose, it doesn't win on the first ballot, he's going to lose. And that's what Jean Charest was hoping, because Jean Charest knows he's not the front runner. It was whoever consolidates the anti front runner vote, and whoever is like second place. The thing is, Jean Charest thinks or thought he was in second place, but it might be Leslie Lewis who is in second place. And that's not to say that I, I'm, I appreciate that Leslie Lewis is explicitly pro life. And here in Canada, abortion, which would be like murder, would be under the criminal code, which is federal jurisdiction, although states provide it with their socialist healthcare systems. Meanwhile, in the United States, it really isn't. Um, it abortion really isn't a federal level. It shouldn't. Should, it shouldn't never be touched at the federal level. It should be at the state level, because murder is not a federal crime. It's not supposed to be a federal crime. Um, and it's not like I agree with her on supply management. It's really bad. And she she wants PPC voters to come to the CPC, but he, she forgets that supply management is one of Maxime Bernier's signature policies before the pandemic. This is one of the big things that he was pushing for. This is one of the reasons why he broke with the Conservative Party in the first place. Supply management of dairy, poultry, and eggs. Um, this centralist system. I remember Sheila Gunn-Reed called it Stal Stalinist. <laughs> Um, it came, it was, I think, passed in 1971, but came into effect 1972. So we've had this cent uh, this cronyist system for around 50 years. And instead of having a free trade system where we can, we can export, uh, Canadian farmers can export their, their products to international markets rather than just have a protection be, being protected and have uh, because in this protectionist system they're they are limiting their their potential to just Canadian consumers like they're limiting how much money they can make they they they're limiting their prosperity to just the Canadian market but when you have the international market then you're you're you have boundless potential, essentially, for profits. <laughs> um, and you can make more, you can, you, you have your ability to make money is determined by how much you produce. Because several, a lot of farmers produce more than they can actually sell in Canada. They have a quota in this in Canada and sometimes they spill milk on the floor and it's it's gross it's... now I, I like kind of like Roman Baber even though he was I wish he had worked with let's say Belinda Carajalios or Rick Nichols or the other independents who were kicked out of the Ontario PC caucus but I like some of his policies including opposition to supply management and wanting to end uh, equalization. 
if you don't know what equalization is, it is this formula put into the Constitution back in <laughs> 1957 when Louis Saint Laurent was still prime minister, like his toward towards the end, right before Diefenbaker got in, and the the Constitution has a formula. Now this this equalization formula has a as a formula, a formula that's supposedly understood by maybe three, like 100% understood by three economists in Canada, which is kind of crazy why we have this stupid policy in the first place, but it ensures that some, the rich provinces give to the poor provinces. It's wealth redistribution and, and what's his name? Roman Baber goes even farther than than um maxime bernier which i actually kind of like and i look i like max but maxime bernier says we will make it more of we will we will change the constant we, we will make the formula so change the formula a bit so that it will be more fair and less generous but he's saying roman baby is saying we we don't even need we don't need to do do that we can we can do it we can stop equalization right now and we don't need the constitution to change we don't need to change the constitution to do it we, within we can work within the formulas and we can show why each province is is uh, capable of being rich enough like by exploiting its own natural resources to no longer rely on on uh, federal money, on, on equalization money. Because so this is one of the stuff that, as you, as you know, a couple years ago, Jason Kennedy had a referendum on equalization. Now he's had this referendum already, like for a couple of years now. And uh, I mean, it went, it went through and passed like, and, but he hasn't done anything. He hasn't done anything at the negotiating table. So this is also something that the, UCP leadership candidates have to talk about. Okay, well, I'm almost out of, I'm almost, almost at the 90 minute mark. But I want to thank you for watching Canadian Meets the South. Um, I know not a lot of people watch this on YouTube. I think more people listen to this is in, uh, on Anchor FM or wherever you get your podcasts, but I want to thank you for uh, support, uh, for for watching me, and uh, I'll be sure to give more commentary on this. But um, I've not decided what my next book is yet, but I will really soon, and then you'll see me post again. But thank you for watching, and uh, I'll see you next time. My Canadian meets the South.